Hello and welcome to our fifth season of the Envisioneering Exchange, the podcast where industry leaders discuss the most important topics in sustainability, climate change, buildings, and urban efficiency. I'm Vic Marinich, Business Development Manager for Danfoss, and I'm delighted to be the host of this podcast. You can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today, we have Phil Atkins from the Moorhead, Kentucky Water Treatment Plant to talk to us about the challenges of water supply and treatment in rural communities. Phil is superintendent of the Moorhead Water Treatment Plant and has been in his current role since 2016. Previously, he worked as an operator at the Moorhead State University Heating and Water Treatment Plant. He has a Class 4 Surface Water Treatment License, a Class 2 Wastewater Treatment License, a bachelor's degree from Welch College, and has served on the board of the Kentucky Water and Wastewater Operators Association since 2018. Phil, thanks for taking the time to join the show. Thanks, Dick. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys and uh, and share from the perspective of an operator and an end user of your products. And uh, I think we'll have a good time. Appreciate it. So let's start with water scarcity and efficiency, right? That's a big issue. And we see that globally as well as locally. Can you tell us a little bit about the community of Moorhead and talk about its water needs and challenges? Yeah, absolutely. We're a small town, about 7,000 people, but we have a a state regional university here. So uh, they've got a little over 8,000 students. When school's in, uh, the population here doubles. And we're a regional producer. We produce all the water for two counties, but our water goes into parts of six other counties. So altogether, maybe around 50,000 people that, you know, our water touches every day. We're fortunate here, really, uh, we've seen pretty sustained population growth, both in in our county and and the neighboring county that we supply all the water for. We're growing at a 6%, uh, 7% rate, and the the neighboring county is about 12 or 13%. But uh, as far as our production growth over the last 10 years, and I was just putting this data together, just a couple of weeks ago for something else, but we've actually seen over the last 10 years a 20% growth in our water production at our treatment plant. And that's been really fueled more by uh, industrial growth in our area than it has been residential growth. Uh, but so our challenges now uh, really are, are kind of forecasting water demand out for say the next 50 years at the growth rates that we're at and also anticipated further economic development, uh, but also regulatory landscapes, as we want to, uh, anything we do, we want to be the best at it that we can be. And that's, that's our goal from the top down in our utility. Uh, our general manager is, is very clear about that, that we want to be, we want to be the best in the state at everything that we touch. And so anything that we design or we do, we want to design around what gives us our best chance to, uh, to not just comply, but exceed federal and and state regulations. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you're definitely in a rural community there, right, with the the university nearby. And the rural communities, you guys, I think, have some uh, extra challenges, right, probably more impacted by aging infrastructure. You talked a bit about maybe a declining population and, and of course, decreased financial resources. How have those challenges affected the plant's operations? Uh, for sure, all those things come into play. We're like I said, we're fortunate that we're seeing a you know a positive growth rate and not decline. But actually, most of our neighbors in our half of the state are seeing a population decline, and that's that's really in large part due to like the, the boom and the bust of the coal industry. Eastern Kentucky, particularly southeastern Kentucky, is is really heavy on heavily dependent on coal production, and uh, in the the climate that we're in now, it's that industry is really a shell of what it used to be. And so we've seen there are counties in, in this part of the state that have 10, 15, 20 percent population loss uh, since the 2010 census. And that's huge. So if you're in a if you're in a rural county that, that say, has 18,000 population and in the last 15 years, 20 years, uh, you've dropped from 18,000 to 13,000. I mean, that's enormous. And when you look at those utilities, they're usually understaffed. And I, I really appreciate those men and women that run those utilities because I know of one utility that they've got about 600 miles of pipe in the ground. They have two people. Uh, you have the, the manager of the utility and a helper 
And then there, there are a couple, couple of ladies that work in the office, but those guys are everything. That's management and that's the people that go out and fix leaks. And it's such a huge hot network to have to, to maintain. So they're understaffed. And with the population decline, that's a declining customer base. And you have a lot of high paying jobs that have left. And the economic reality is that don't really make rate increases on your customers very practical because what you're left with is a lot of people that are on a fixed income and uh, they, they can't absorb rate increases uh, all that well. So aging infrastructure, though, is a problem for utilities of every size. So whether you're a, a large metro uh, utility or, or you're a small utility with just a couple hundred customers, we've all got aging assets, uh, you know, be it at the plants or or remote assets, and there's, you know, there's a tremendous cost to replacing all those and uh, maintaining those. So I think it's more of a pronounced problem for the the rural systems because they just don't have the same size customer base to be able to absorb those costs. And uh, unfortunately, funding is funding is out there. Don't get me wrong. And there's been a lot of federal dollars in recent years that have gone towards uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. But it's competitive to get those grant funds. It's even competitive to get those state revolving funds that come with a low interest rate. And so one of the key factors in, in getting those funds is how many people are touched by this project. And so if you're a system that has thousands and thousands and thousands of customers, your project is going to impact far more people than a small town that's going to do a project maybe that only impacts 200 customers. And that gives you such a competitive advantage when going through the, the loan or the grant process. So another thing too, if you're a large utility, you probably have a person whose sole job is to chase grant money and, and to write those grants. If, if you're the system uh, that I was talking about uh, just a minute ago, I mean, you've got two people. Uh, one of them's a ditch digger and the other guy wears about every other hat in the organization and they don't have they don't have the type of uh, office support or, or professional support for uh, for chasing that funding. So it, it can be very difficult for them to keep up and, uh, and very difficult for them to do big infrastructure projects. Yeah, I mean, it almost sounds like you kind of are stuck in this loop, right? I mean, you, you have the aging infrastructure. You need the funds, but uh, you, you know you're losing the population, so you don't have as many people. So you're not quite getting the funds, so the infrastructure gets worse, and people are moving. You kind of get stuck in this closed loop. That's got to be pretty frustrating, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right, and that and that's a problem facing Appalachia. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. the brain drain. This is what we call it here. So yeah, when those high paying jobs leave, those people working those jobs leave too. They have they have to go find economic opportunity elsewhere, and if you're left with the, the two biggest employers in that community or, or the school system and Walmart, then there's not that much opportunity. And, and when the best and brightest of young people come up and they go off to college, there's nothing to come home to. So they, they have to go where their skills can, you know, where there's a market for their skills. And you're right. It's just, it's a cycle. And so it's, it's a catch 22. There are a lot of, a lot of small water districts out there, at least in, in my area, that have 40, 50, 60 percent water loss. It's not as easy as just fixing the leaks because they don't have they can't afford to fix the leaks. But then they, they can't afford to fix the leaks because they're losing more water than they're actually billing their customers for. And it's how do you break that cycle? And that that's really tough. And really, grant funding is, is about the only way to do that for a lot of the small communities. And like I said they're at a disadvantage trying to trying to procure those funds. Right. And that kind of comes around to another issue with water and wastewater treatment plants is the uh, not just the water itself, but the cost of the energy. And at least according to the EPA, the energy use on water and wastewater treatment plants can account for up to 40 percent of the energy use by the municipal governments. So as uh, we're pushing to decarbonize and improve energy efficiency and so on, there's also a push for water and wastewater plants to save energy. So why is this uh, more of a challenge for smaller plants like Moorhead? Well, I mean, it's the high upfront capital cost. We want to be efficient and we're doing things to be more efficient, but there's such a high upfront cost for, for some projects. And then, and then your return on investment is stretched out so far into the future. So if you're a board 
or a city council and you're trying to decide where to spend money, well, you could spend six, seven figures on this project to boost your energy efficiency at the water plant or at the wastewater plant. But you also may be looking at a payback for that investment of, of 20 or 30 years down the road, in which case, you know, most of those people voting on that measure are going to be gone. I mean, it, they're not going to live to see the payback on that. And so when you have so many different priorities within a community as far as how to invest your resources, most people who are decision makers, they want to invest that money in something that that has either a, a quicker a return on investment or something that's very public and pretty that they get to take credit for. Uh, that's just the political uh, <laughs> reality. Of it. You know, for us, with my department's budget, energy costs run about 20%. And that's large. You know, as a company, between the water and wastewater plant, hub stations, wastewater lift stations, I mean, we spend over a million dollars a year on energy costs. And so we do want to be more efficient. If we could be 10% more efficient, then that's that's six figures we're saving. And just like nobody likes to raise rates, but every good utility should be raising rates incrementally two, 3% a year. Well, you know, every 100,000 here, 100,000 there that you can save is money that you can budget elsewhere. It's like getting a rate increase without actually having to increase the, the rates because you can invest back into uh, different projects. You can replace pipelines that are aging. You can replace uh, equipment in, in your pipe stations, your lift stations, or you can invest in your people because competitive wages is, is one of the biggest uh, issues facing our industry now. And so, so taking care of your people and retaining them is huge as well. When we look back on the energy efficiency and you mentioned uh, 10, 20, 30 year paybacks isn't something that's going to have the voters and the local politicians all that excited. So how has Moorhead and the plant addressed those challenges? Many of our energy efficiency goals are addressed in the new the new water treatment plant that we're, we're constructing now because our plant was built in the 1960s. Everything's more efficient than what we have now. So a, a lot of that is addressed. It'll be all LED lighting. And when you're replacing, we probably in my plant have 40 or 50, like 500 watt mercury vapor floodlights. We replace that with like 65 watt LED lighting that gives you the, the same or more lumens. That's taken a step towards efficiency, but but even the new plant is spec with like R38 insulation. I don't know what the R factor of my 1960s plant is, but it doesn't touch R38. So, you know, HVAC equipment is going to be more efficient than what we have now. But, you know, if you're not building a new plant, we've done things to improve efficiency with all of our remote assets, our, our pump stations, those were all on uh, on soft starters until the last five years. And we've we've changed all those over to VFDs. We've seen some power savings there for sure, but also replacing old pumps and old motors with more efficient models. And even in, in terms of things like lighting at the plant, when we know that we're gonna be taking dynamite to our existing plant in just you know a couple of years. We don't wanna to invest too much into that. The facility since we're getting ready to demolish it, but over the last several years, we've had light fixtures that have uh, that have gone out. We're not going to go out and buy a new ballast. Let's just let's go put a, a new LED fixture in. That savings doesn't necessarily show up real big on the balance sheet, but every little bit helps when you're trying to operate as efficiently as you can and get the most out of your resources. Maybe we'll take a, a half step back when we talk about the, the water plant. So where does the water supply come from and how has that changed over the past few years? So our, our water supply comes from the, the Licking River and it's actually a good clean source. We Most of the watershed for the Licking River uh, upstream of, of where we draw from is in the Daniel Boone National Forest. And uh, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of big industry in the headwaters of uh, the Licking River watershed, and it's, it's really a, a steep, hilly terrain. There's not really a lot of big agri agriculture either. We have a, you know, small family farms that people may have, you know, 10 or 15 head of cattle. You don't have like a big cattle operation with 2,000 head of cattle. And so that's really good, and our source water is, is good. We are susceptible to flood events because where our intake uh, sits just below the dam of, of Cave Run Lake, 
then about a mile below our intake, there's a large creek that, that drains our entire county into uh, the Licking River. The Corps of Engineers, they're there for flood control, and we're glad they're there and, and run that lake. But when we have heavy rain events, they're going to close their discharge because they don't want to make the flooding problem even worse. They close those gates, and the river actually runs backwards on us. And so our source water in the blink of an eye could go from, say, a, a two turbidity to over 600 turbidity. And those floodwaters, I mean, our, our raw pH could go from, say, a 7.4 to a 6.4. Alkalinity could go from 50 down to single digits. It's just difficult water to treat. And it's never the same with each flood event. You always, you know, I wish there were magic numbers to be able to, uh, to just say, okay, when we get a flood event, this is the chemical settings that we use. It takes a little bit of time to figure that out. And so we're prone to that, but uh, we're also prone to some seasonally tough water in the fall when the Corps of Engineers is drawing the lake down to winter pool. As that water on the surface starts to really cool, the thermocline in the lake rises. And so the gate that they have to discharge from, we start getting water from deep in the lake that, that really is uh, septic, just nasty smelling water, but it's loaded with organics uh, and it's loaded with iron and manganese and it it can be very difficult to treat as well. The water could be clear as a bell, but it, you know, it comes down the river looking like, uh, you know, having a rest to look to it. And it takes a lot of chemical to, to treat that. So we're moving our intake to Cave Run Lake. We'll have a much more stable source water. It should uh, use quite a bit less the chemical to treat that water. And that's good because I don't know about you, Vic, but I, I want as little chemicals in my water as possible. Absolutely. And then you know, another benefit, and, and when it comes to energy savings, we'll be gaining 90 feet in elevation. And so that that's 90 feet less uh, head that we have to overcome pumping that water to the plant. So at our existing intake, we have uh, 335 horsepower pumps, new intake, uh, all those pumps will be 275 horsepower. So we'll realize some energy savings there uh, just from, from changing the, the location of where we, where we draw from. So you uh, teased the audience a little bit talking about the new plant. So can you give us a little bit more uh, insights there around the new water treatment plant? What's the construction process looking like? What kind of factors uh, did you take into account uh, for the project specifications and so on? Okay. Well, we could talk for a long time on that, but I'm going to try to make this short. Uh, so uh, we started the timeline on that really in 2015. We commissioned a study to basically determine whether we were going to do a, uh, an upgrade and expansion of the existing plant or uh, or build a new plant. And the decision was made that we would uh, we'd be better off to, uh, to just do a greenfield project, everything completely new. And so we moved forward that in 2016 and our engineer and I, we've traveled all over the Eastern U S we really did our diligence. We're, we're going to be building a low pressure membrane plant, but that wasn't where we started. Uh, initially we were going to just build a larger version of, uh, of the ballasted flocculation plant that we have now, but in doing our diligence on different technologies that were out there, uh, we really kind of fell in love with what membranes can do for us. And so, with our plant now, we use gravity filtration, sand filters. Most plants in the world use gravity filters. Everybody loves gravity because gravity works for free. You know, you don't have to pump through that. But, you know, our gravity filters will take out particles down to about 100 micron in size. This is really small. But the UF membranes that we selected uh, have a nominal pore opening of 0 0.01 micron in size. And so it's sort of like a total barrier. I mean, you know, bacteria viruses, protozoans, they can't get through those. And so we're really attracted to that, we're really attracted to just the super low turbidity water that those produce. And so we went that route and then um, following those membranes don't take out everything. So some things are in solution and they'll, you know, they'll pass through a membrane. Things like, uh, like dissolved organics, which once you oxidize those with, with chlorine, form distribution byproducts, trihalomethanes, haleocytic acids. Those are things that are regulated. Uh, those are known to cause cancer and we don't want to cause cancer. So it's a good goal to have. Yeah. Yeah. 
so we studying our source water, we, we found that about 95% of our natural organic matter uh, is actually dissolved. And, and so they would pass through the membranes. So we follow the membranes up with granular activated carbon vessels. And those are kind of the ultimate safety blanket. They'll remove that natural organic matter. They'll absorb that. But now PFOS is in the news. We've just got PFOS rigs uh, recently from EPA. And not a lot of people are, are very well positioned to comply with that regulation when it goes in, in, in 2026. But our carbon is going to absorb that. So we'll, we'll be really well positioned for that. If we were to have a harmful algae spill on our reservoir that we're going to draw from, or a harmful algae bloom, we'll be able to keep right on running because the carbon is going to absorb the cyanotoxins. A diesel tanker could spill right beside our intake, and we can keep on operating because the carbon is going to remove that. And so the membranes give you like ultra low turbidity filtrate, and then the carbon acts as more of a polishing final step. Between those two treatment technologies, I feel really confident that we're going to make some really exceptional water. And uh, we're all really looking forward to that finally opening. Right now, we're, we're looking at the fall of, of 2024. So fall of next year will be started. You mentioned a lot of uh, the different technologies you were looking at. How did you go about setting the goals for the project, how you wanted it to look in the end? Well, the goal is if, if you're going to spend that kind of money, we want to make the best water in the state. We don't just say that. Again, we, we wanted to plan like 50 years out. So what's going to give us the supply that we need to meet projected demand? And then what type of water quality do we want? You know, I don't anticipate any regulation in my lifetime or in the next 50 years that we're not going to be able to just completely knock out of the park with this new plant. So those were the goals. And obviously, obviously, things like efficiency are, are, are goals as well, which is why, you know, everything in our new plant that has a motor on it is going to have a Danfoss drive on it. And we certainly appreciate that. So you mentioned, right, all the pumping systems are utilizing uh, variable speed drives. Can you talk about how maybe uh, smaller plants like yours can benefit from that technology? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways. We didn't have any drives until a few years ago. And really where that started out was... Uh, trying to operate our raw water pumps. I mean, they were just running off soft starters and that's better than like a hard start because a hard start is like going zero to 60 now, you know, a soft starter, you're going to zero to 60 in a few seconds. And with drives, you can go zero to 60 in like 90 seconds or two minutes. I mean, what that does is that is much easier on your pumps, on your motor. It's, it's easier on your equipment but it's really a lot easier on your, on your pipeline system as well. So if you imagine, let's say I'm running one, one of my small high service pumps at 2,500 gallons a minute, and then I need to send more water into the distribution system. So I start up a, a bigger pump to run simultaneously with that. And I go from 2,500 gallons a minute to 6,500 gallons a minute, you know, all at once into just a matter of a few seconds. That causes such a hammer in that distribution system one of the big benefits, I don't care if you're a big system or if you're a small system, one of the big benefits is if you can replace those soft starters and go in with a drive and you can slowly ramp that flow up. And then when you're shutting that pump off, you can slowly ramp that flow back down. Then you're taking out that hammer every time you start or stop one of those pumps. And I really believe that when we get our new plant up and operational, probably reduce our, our line breaks in our distribution system probably by 50%, maybe more, because you're not hammering that every time you start and stop a pump. And it gives you flow control. Like I said, like several years ago, we went with uh, a couple of drives at, at our intake so that we could address that. If, if we have to double pump from our intake, but we only need 4,800 gallons a minute, that the solution before that was just to go down there in the valve pit and choke a valve down. And so you're running one pump wide open with no restriction. And then you're trying to get 1500 gallon a minute out of the other pump by choking that down. So it's, it's not quite deadheading. The problem with that is the pump that's running wide open at 3,500 gallon a minute. That other one is having to try to overcome the pressure from that pump. And what we found is we were tearing up pumps. I mean, we were just smoking them. 
uh, left and right, and those are big, expensive pumps. So they cost a lot to replace and and cost a ridiculous amount to repair. So those are benefits in our distribution system. Maybe about five years ago, uh, we started replacing all of our pump stations, uh, those soft starts with drives. The reason we did that, I mean, we, we wanted drives, we wanted energy efficiency, but we were fixing to take down one by one every storage tank in our distribution system and have those sandblasted and recoded and renovated. And in order to do that, I mean, you take a tank out of service, you still have to maintain pressure in that pressure zone. You have to be able to supply water. And so we were able to operate those pump stations off the drives where, where we set a discharge pressure for the drives to maintain. And they would do that. I mean, if somebody opened up a fire hose, you know, that, that pump is just running constantly. It, it may only be running at 20 hertz. Somebody opens a fire hose and, man, it's going to ramp that pump, pump up almost instantly. It, it meets that demand. And then when that demand goes away, it, it ramps that back down. So we're able to hold constant system pressure while those tanks were out of service. It, it really enabled us to do that. And uh, without that, I don't, I don't know how you could effectively remove a tank out of service and still maintain that pressure and keep that supply of water to those customers. You're talking about an asset like a tank being out of service, say, for two months while this work's going on. So those are all big benefits. We have to get to the cost, though, and, and energy efficiency. That's the first pump station that, that we uh, renovated and, and put drives in. We did that. We also changed out the, the pumps and motors. But when we did that, I know the salesman tells you you're, you're going to save money doing this. But so for this pump station, the first month after we do that, my electric bill there goes from fifteen hundred dollars down to eleven hundred dollars. Holy smokes! You know, and we're not seeing that every month. We usually see about two or three hundred dollars uh, per month less electric costs there. We see that at all those pump stations. They are more efficient, and you can program those to uh, basically to meet your needs. You can program them to run efficiently. And something we're really looking at now, too, there's an efficiency curve on on every pump curve that you look at, and you always want to be in the curve. But specifically, what we're looking at now is the peak efficiency point. And so instead of operating two pumps wide open, it may be that you can operate three pumps simultaneously. I don't know, let's say at like 30 hertz each, you're moving the same amount of water and you're using less energy to do it. And so... Those are things that we're looking for is, is ways that we can uh, well, get more life out of our assets, but ways we can also be more efficient, save money uh, while we're doing it. Right. So instead of trying to optimize each individual component, like a pump, you look at optimize that whole system. So across multiple pumps to get them all singing on the same page optimally, right? Yeah, that makes good sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you're talking about operating cost, but we touched on a little bit before, right? One of the big barriers to adopting a lot of this technology on uh, around energy efficiency is that first cost, right? And we talked about it too, right? Municipal governments, they want to see a return on investment, right? Not in decades, but in a few years. So how can both governments and consumers benefit from investments in greater energy efficiency and water treatment, you think? It goes back again to the operational cost uh, savings. So anytime you, you construct something new or, or do, a, do a big replacement, you're, you're going to have that upfront cost. But the way that I would try to sell it to people is, well, you're going to have to spend the money anyway, right? So if, if you're going to have to build a new pump station, if you're going to have to replace components in an existing pump station, then you might as well absorb the cost then and, and shoot for that efficiency. Everything you save, though, like I said, is, is like a rate increase. If I can cut my operational expenses by 3%, that's 3% I don't have to raise customer rates. And so that's how they benefit. Let me use an example of, you know, when I first became a supervisor at my water plant, one of the things I looked at was chemicals and, and chemical costs. Chemical, we spend a fortune on chemicals. And at the time, we were purchasing everything from two different companies, two products from one and then like 10 products from another and great people love them to death but there had never been any competition for our business and so we looked for ways to be more efficient and we were more efficient with our chemical usage without affecting water quality without you know having any you know we wouldn't do that 
uh, sacrifice quality for savings. But one of the things I do is open it up for competition. Everybody in the region that can sell me a chemical, I invited them to shoot me a price on that chemical. And so in my first year as supervisor, we saved $117,000 on chemicals just by opening the door to competition. And we buy from like five or six companies now, not just one or two. Unfortunately, power companies don't have competition. You know, I mean, you're pretty well stuck with who you got. I guess you could say that about, about your water provider as well. You, <laughs> you're stuck with us whether you like us or not. Yeah. But anything you can save, and if you can save ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars a year on on power cost, maybe you're saving six figures. I mean, that's found money. That's money, like I said earlier, that you can reinvest into other places. So don't look at so much the upfront, the capital expense up front because you're going to have to replace a lot of these assets anyway. When, while you replace them, uh, let's get as efficient as we can because the more efficient we can be, the more money we have to fix other problems. And that benefits the utilities, that benefits the customers because our resources are limited. And uh, as managers, if we're not looking for ways to be efficient in everything we do, if we're not trying to stretch the resources that we do have, then ultimately we're not really doing our jobs. Before we sign off, any uh, last minute comments you want to make for our audience here? You know, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that when we expect our new water treatment plant, we only expect Dan Foss drives. We didn't list a competitor for you guys to compete with. And it's because, you know, in 2018, as we, as we started renovating our pump stations and outfitting those with drives, we went with Danfoss then, you know, uh, those initial drives we put in compared to the drives that we had had before from one of your competitors that I won't mention my name, the drives were great. I mean, we, we still have not had the first issue out of them, but they're just so easy to communicate with and to talk to the program. And so when we designed our new facility, we really saw a lot of value there in standardizing on just one particular drive because I, I don't want for, for my guys to have to learn how to, how to communicate with two or three or four different kind of drives. And so we kind of took that out of the hands of, uh, of the contractor and, and just that's how we feel about Dan Foss drives that, that we only expect those for that. So we appreciate you guys and, uh, how you're able to help us and, and all the extra data and control that we're able to, to harness, uh, from our, our assets because of your uh, equipment. Oh, that's fantastic and super exciting to hear that uh, all the work that I know our engineers and R&D people put into getting those drives to be uh, as high quality as they are is paying off and seeing value. So we really appreciate the feedback. So with that, that's it for this episode of Envisioneering Exchange. Uh, I'd like to thank my guest, Phil Atkins from the Moorhead Water Treatment Plant for joining us today. All right, thank you, Vic. Don't forget to subscribe to Envisioneering Exchange on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate, review, and share with your network. Thanks for listening and talk to you next time. This podcast is for information purposes only. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Envisioneering Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and not necessarily represent those of Danfoss LLC and its employees. Danfoss LLC is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the podcast series available for listening on this site. This podcast series does not constitute professional advice or services. This podcast, including Danfoss LLC and the producers, disclaim responsibility from any possible adverse effects of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and Dan Foss LLC in this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility of statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about the guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast. The developers of the Envisioneering Exchange podcast site assume no liability for any activities in connection with this podcast or for use of this podcast in connection with any other website computer or playing device.